Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our first partner event between We Coffee and Startups Magazine. My name's Ben, I'm the founder of We Coffee, and we're a members club for freelancers, founders, and flexible workers. I'm just gonna pass over to Anna to introduce herself, and then we'll go over to a little bit of housekeeping before we kick off. Hello everyone, um, I'm Morgan. I'm Anna Hubby, the editor of Startups Magazine. We're a print and online publication dedicated to championing tech startups. Um, we're so pleased to be here today, joined um, with our amazing partner, We Coffee, um, talking about such an important topic, the future of work. So obviously we've been through a lot of changes recently. So we have two of the most amazing guests to talk us through. Um, and we've also got some more um, pieces online and in the next issue. Um, if you want further reading, check them out. Thank you, Ben. Super. Thank you very much, Anna. As Anna was saying, we're due a really exciting event today. We've got two fantastic guest speakers for our Q&A sessions. The first of these is going to be between Anna Flockett, uh, from Startup Magazine and Katrina Larker, a co-founder of Fora, a business that at We Coffee, we absolutely love to follow and really believe in what they're doing in the co-working environment. And just in case that's not enough for today, we also have our CEO advisor to a business that has been making headlines everywhere for the last few months. We have Magnus Falk with us from Zoom. Hi everyone. So without further ado, I am going to open the webinar session with a bit of an overview to what we mean by the future of work before we go into this first Q&A session. So at We Coffee, we look at the future of work through three main lenses, really. The first of these is looking at the jobs that we're going to be doing in the future. The second of these that we'll cover today was actually the one that led to the birth of We Coffee, which is where are we going to be doing those jobs from? And the very last thing that we'll be looking at is what are the challenges that are actually associated to these changes in the future of work? And what are we going to need to do to try and overcome them? So in terms of the jobs we'll do, it's actually really hard to be specific. As always, you've got consultancies working away with analysts working incredibly hard on models trying to predict what sort of jobs it is that we will be doing into the future. But in realism, this is only ever a model. What we do know though, instead of the specific jobs we'll do, are some of the drivers that are gonna exist going forwards. And the ones that we'll cover today are robotics, automation and AI, and a move to a freelancer economy. So in terms of robotics, it's actually quite challenging to think just how many jobs are going to be affected. But all you need to do really is put on a good sci-fi movie or pick up an Isaac Asimov book and you can start to see the dreams and imaginations of tech entrepreneurs that will probably be realized around the world over the coming decades. And when you look into this, you see it's some pretty complex jobs out there, such as heart surgery, but there's less obvious things. Imagine all your military personnel being faced by robots, a personal chef that you could pull out a kitchen cupboard and plug in to cook your dinner, a personal trainer that might be able to take you on your exercises and play tennis with you, hairdressers, opticians, all sorts of jobs. Our worlds are just gonna become ever more convenient through this increase in robotics. According to the World Economic Forum, they believe it's something like 75 million jobs that are gonna be displaced globally by the change of robotics. And that's by 2022, so two years away from where we are now. You might ask yourself, how on earth do they come up with this number? Well, what they did was they surveyed somewhere around 50 million employees globally across a whole range of sectors and looked at what those changes would actually be they found that it was somewhere around about 11% of jobs would be gained in a really positive status from new jobs coming out from robotics, but about 10% of jobs would be lost. So on a percentage scale, you go, great, there's more jobs than being lost, but it wasn't quite that simple, actually. They cut it out by sector and how many jobs were in each of these sectors. What it actually turned out was really exciting. 133 million new jobs they believe will be created by 2022 versus that 75 million jobs lost. It does mean people will need to retrain, to reskill and come up with some of the other challenges 
that we're going to focus on later. But to give you an idea, that 133 million new jobs is four times the total number of unemployment across US today during coronavirus in a massive crisis. So quite a substantial change in a positive direction. I said that I'd talk a bit about AI. I've split AI and robotics. Obviously there's sort of, sort of clear overlaps with smart robots, things such as autonomous vehicles, like in the picture of the background. But there's also lots of tasks that are gonna be solely performed by artificial intelligence systems that are probably more on a basic task. AI is gonna take over small, time-consuming tasks that can easily replace human emotions and behaviors that customers and audiences identify with. Some of the easy examples you can look at this today is customer service reps uh, being replaced by bots globally. Additionally, a company might need a chief executive or manager with strong emotional intelligence or teamwork oriented skills. And this is the kind of task that probably won't be replaced. What's quite surprising though, is the number of very complex jobs that will be lost. The ONS is saying it's somewhere between 7% and 10% of all jobs in financial, legal and healthcare that they believe can be performed by AI. So it's probably not gonna be our judges and barristers. They will still need to attend court and represent people and make the decision that are more emotionally based. But for the paralegal, legal research roles, they will almost certainly be replaced by AI. Their processes require hard research, they're expensive, they're tedious, and getting a machine to synthesize this work in legal contracts will just be substantially more efficient and optimized financially for the businesses running them. It's also no secret that healthcare plays really well. Being a doctor or a pharmacist is tough work with lots of training, requiring them to make the right calls. But actually, many of the decisions they have to make are small little illnesses like colds and bugs that don't really need much expertise. And again, looking at an NHS that has been struggling over many years and looking to release funding, almost certainly some of these diagnoses will be moved over to an artificial intelligence system. I put up a bit of a graphic, uh, this one I believe is the ONS one, and it just shows the percentage of different jobs that could be affected over time in different sectors. So as you would imagine, the more elementary occupations have a really significant impact, but please don't underestimate, if you're a managing director or senior official, you can still see that, that there's a big mode at about 30% of those tasks and jobs being replaced, but somewhere up to 40, 50% almost that could be replaced. Yeah, thank you. And you've got the graphic. Brilliant. So then the next question really is just in case you thought you were sitting in a sort of creative job and oh, I'm really safe. I'm an artist. My job is never going to be replaced by an artificial intelligence system. Well, that's not quite true, actually. In 2018, it was sold at Sotheby's in an auction. The painting here you can see in the background for just under £500,000. So there's a real question. If a piece of AI could read you as a person, your interior design in your house, and come up with a painting or a picture or a sculpture that for you was exactly what you wanted, would you commission it? And should it have any less value than if it came from an artist? And then the last big driver that I was gonna talk about was self-employment there is a really big question about who we're actually gonna work for. I think we all know that the gig economy has been growing pretty significantly over the last quarter. And I think you'll be quite surprised to see that in the UK alone, it's been 61% in the last eight years. And actually there's a massive shift to women doing it as well. So if you look at the growth that's been in the UK, it's about twice the number of, of women who are coming in or twice the growth for women coming into the self-employment sector than men. I wonder if this is a sort of shift towards the kind of work we're doing from people working in trades previously to sort of digital marketing 
those digital nomad creative roles that maybe suit better some of the opportunities and, and struggles that have been fought before in the workplace. So as to where we work from, at We Coffee, we believe that this is probably the biggest change that's coming in our future of work. It doesn't just mean the location, but also the tools that we're going to use, that we're going to spend huge parts of our day working from online. Some of the companies that financially benefited from our sort of recent tribulations are going to be the ones that promoted remote working tools. In fact, we have one on our call today with Magnus here from Slack. Those who were previously skeptical of hopefully come to learn that the power of connecting through these tools like Zoom, Slack and Microsoft Teams is actually really viable going forward and potentially a much more efficient way to be running our businesses. What we hope at WeCoffee is that you won't work somewhere like here. I think if we're unlucky and many of us probably are, we have worked in a cubicle a bit like this. And I think the day of these sort of drab offices that dull our souls is definitely going to be a thing of the past. I also actually believe that some of the open plan offices, the sort of cafe replica, where people are trying to bring something into that office environment to make our lives more enjoyable on that day-to-day -day basis, is still not the solution. For me, it's turning up to the same place every day and seeing those same four walls, however they've been laid out, just becomes monotonous and uninspiring. I think this is a perfect example. We also don't suggest that we coffee that you should just go out to somewhere like here. Uh, we don't think that you should be constantly moving around trying to find the strangest office space you can find. I absolutely guarantee you there are some pretty bizarre ones out there that, that you can go and source. Uh, but we don't believe this is the solution. Either. What we do propose though is to think more sensibly about where we work from. We waste huge chunks of our lives on boring commutes. We go to places we don't really want to be, and it's not required. Wouldn't it just be better to drive money back into your local economy and get to know your neighbors and what they do, all while growing your business and not having to commute so much? Why shouldn't you be able to run a bank by living halfway up an alpine mountain with insanely fantastic Wi-Fi and being able to drop out for an hour in the middle of the day to go skiing with your kids. You can even find younger members of the area in somewhere like this theoretical Alpine Mountain might actually decide to stay and work there because their only opportunities are no longer in tourism and they don't have to move to some burgeoning job capital of the world to be able to seek the career that they want to achieve. I talked a little bit about the commutes and some of the challenges faced with going with the commutes. The time wasted to me is just phenomenal. I had a background in automotive and then looking at transport services. And I came up with a theory that the best commute is no commute. You think 74 minutes a day, okay, that's maybe not too bad, but actually if you start to count it and rack it up, which I have done, it's pretty significant. It's a day in a month. It's two weeks in a year, and it's half a year in every decade. So if you start to think what you would give for 12 days holiday a year, then maybe giving up that commute makes a lot of sense. And it's not just the time wasted, actually. It's emissions. Spend all of this time, as I said, in my automotive background, trying to design emissions out of vehicles. Well, if you don't commute, you'll save a lot. Um, I mean, you can see this is outside of London. So generally people driving to work and you're looking at two and a half kilos of CO2 a person a day. So the last thing that I said I'd talk about is how these jobs in the future are actually gonna challenge us. Well, as I alluded to, my background was in automotive as a mechanical engineer and I worked on brake systems powered by hydraulics from moving oil effectively around pipes and pistons, all generated through human application. Cars pretty quickly changed in my career, so I had to adapt to learn new skills to allow me to design brakes driven by electronics and software. 
these new skills have led me on a completely meandering path from learning the software side into where I am now as a founder for a tech-based business providing workspaces to people. The emphasis that I really want to put on this story is this requirement to constantly develop and retrain as a way to stave off these robots, AI, and other changing landscapes. I did a little bit of research on this talk because I was really interested to know what happened between freelancers and full-time employees in retraining. And I could only find one study, actually. It was completed by Upwork and the Freelancers Union across the US in 2017. But it showed substantially over half of freelancers actually try and retrain within every given six-month period. It's about a third of full-time employees that then go and do retraining over this same period. So on one plus side, freelancers are much better than doing this than employees, but there's still a lot more people in full-time employment today. So what really scares me is that we will have this tendency to make people redundant who are full-time employees in businesses rather than retraining them as we go through this skill set change. One of the other things I've seen working in a corporate environment before I moved over to my own business was something that I first actually picked up from Eric Reese. for anyone who's read Lean Startup, is this idea that corporations often take people who may be excellent at doing operations and try and move them to an innovation space. Or you look at the story of Blockbuster and they took the youngest person in the room to run their online business because they felt he was the closest one to the internet. He had no suitable skills for this at all, whatever. Um, and I think this is a real danger. So I would love for companies to really look at what skill sets their employees have and try and match appropriately and retrain and fill the gaps going forward. I think there's also a really strong economic debate about working from anywhere. So what you can see here is the average day rates of independent workers in different countries across the world. Uh, and the idea is it's been normalized across doing similar tasks. So is there a reason that someone in the United States should be paid $70 an hour to do the same job that someone in North Africa is paid $41? I'll be honest, my personal instinct to this is no, this is not correct. I am definitely a believer in a borderless world and a more democratic system to this. But I'm also aware that life's not that simple. I was speaking to my business partner about this before we came into the talk and he made me aware of uh, Phil Knight, for anyone who doesn't know who is the founder of Nike, and a problem he had first launching factories over in Africa. He was launching factories over there. He was trying to pay really competitive wages to Western wages. And he had problems where local government directly came up to him and explained to him that what he was doing was having significant impact on trying to drive people into jobs such as hospitals, as doctors in the local economy, because he was paying an equivalent wage without the required training and years of dedication and flooding workforce into his factories. So I believe he resulted in dropping the wages. Uh, personally, I don't fully agree with this as a solution, but the point is it's just not as simple as we can have this global economy with people working from anywhere and it will be completely fair and just. There's gonna be some much more complex discussions and careful negotiations that we're gonna to have to take into account. The last thing that I'm going to end with uh, is to talk about the relationships that we build in these workspaces and in our jobs. I think it's really important to not forget the value of the connections and the social interactions that we gain whilst at work. One of the things we learned really early on in our journey at We Coffee is the value is not just in the space, it's in the people within it. We all have that local cafe or a pub or a restaurant that might not have the most beautiful interior around, but we like going there because of how we feel when we go inside, because of the atmosphere around us, how we're greeted and met by the staff who work there. And as you can see on the stat here, it's proven by the fact that even in a world of Tinder, one in 10 of us are still meeting the love of our life at work. That just wouldn't be true if it wasn't for those social interactions and the importance that's gained in those working environments. 
So we believe that whatever happens in the future, we'll still want to be around others, we'll value shared experiences, and it will build collaboration, shared success, shared failures, or just having a coffee with one another will never go away. It just might not be in your office with your immediate colleague. And that's it from us as We Coffee. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Do come and check us out at wecoffee.io. Hopefully after the event, you should receive an invite to come and join us for one of our networking events. We do these online in Zoom every Monday and Wednesday, and it would be great to see some of you from over there. So thank you very much. That's all from me for now. I'm gonna pass over next to Anna Flockett from Startups Magazine and Katrina Larkin, the co-founder of Bora. So thank you very much for listening and over to Anna. Ben, thank you so much. I know that we are conscious of time, but you do have one question that quite a few people have asked if you could answer. Um, so I thought I'd just throw it to you quickly. Um, one of our uh, listeners, Joe, has said, um, Ben, what would your advice be to employers who are still, even after the lockdown period, reluctant to introduce remote and flexible working? I think this is a really challenging one. If they're reluctant over it during the period, you have to ask yourself why. I guess there's probably two main answers. I, I try to break things very logically into decision trees. It's a horrible engineering background, but I look at one answer is they're not a trusting person. Um, and maybe there's an educational process to go through here that I'm not fit or right for. And some sort of coach or counselor or business consultant should come in and speak to them about how this could work for them. I think on the other side, there's a possibility that it just genuinely hasn't actually worked for them as a business. And not everyone is built well for working remotely. This is just a fact. Um, and maybe their employment processes in the past haven't fit that quite right. So maybe they haven't built a team that has the right percentage of people to drive those behaviors through. And I think some companies will just have to look at their employment in the future to be employing people who will work well remotely and drive the rest of the team to do it. So it's very hard to answer this specifically without knowing the exact situation, but I find generally it's one of these two paths that's, that's leading to the issue. Amazing, thank you. Thank you again for your talk, it was great. I know quite a few people probably want to see some of your um, figures and stats afterwards. Um, so thank you everyone. Um, let me welcome Katrina to our screens. Well, she's already there, but Katrina, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for being here. Um, so I guess um, just for everyone who doesn't know how amazing you and Forest Space is, um, would you like to just tell us a little bit about Forest Space? Um, obviously you co-founded it, you know, where did the idea come from? Um, and yeah, just a little bit about you. Okay, so um, my name is Katrina. Um, I'm probably best known for co-founding the Big Chill Festival. Um, for those who don't know that, it was the festival that coined the term boutique festival. And it was a whole mix. We were the first to bring in street food. We brought the BFI out of London. It was about arts. It was about music. It was about involving and giving the people who came every year a sense of belonging. And it became very successful and it ran for 18 years and we opened three bars for our community. We had a record label, we did radio shows, we brought out books. And it was quite an incredible experience to be in. And every year people would get together to celebrate, but they would also spend the rest of the year if they were across the country engaging with each other on their forum and they call, call themselves chilling. So after doing that for 18 years I was absolutely fascinated with what brings people together and how you can give people a, a better quality of life almost or introduce them to experiences that they may not feel they have the opportunity to have. And so when I was first approached about co-working by our investors, 
I was a little bit like, no, you know, my, my whole history is about people. You know, I bring people together. I, I just love nothing better than watching people smile and share and network and form new ideas together, of which many came to fruition from the big chill. So I was thinking, you know, of those pictures that Ben was showing earlier of cubicles. And I was like, no, that's not me. I don't want to do that. <sighs> but then something struck me because I was involved in Camden Lock and the interchange, which was their co-working space we were working on. And suddenly something sparked in my head. Wouldn't it be amazing if I could get involved in a business that looked at how people spent their every day and I was talking to so many friends who were talking to me on Sunday night that dread would come in it would almost ruin their whole Sunday and um, they'd started yoga at the beginning of the year and they'd never finished it or they'd started a college course or they were looking for inspiration and you know, their job was quite good the culture at work wasn't quite right and I suddenly thought my gosh I hope I've learned something in 18 years about how you bring people together and give them that sense of belonging, but let them own the direction of the journey you're on with you. Yeah. And could you put that into the workplace? Could you create spaces that weren't grey cubicles, that thought about how people spent their every day? It wasn't about going in and looking at floor plans and deciding, you know, everybody needs this X amount square foot for, for their desk and how they work. You almost thought of it like a hotel. And I was very fortunate then to meet a gentleman called Enrico Sanna, who was from Deutsche. And he was involved in the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Las Vegas. Oh, wow. So the two of us met at the beginning of this and I just loved his energy and we spent the whole evening talking about how service was quite poor in London and that how people needed to be treated with more respect and if we ever started a company to, again we wanted it all to be about the people that were involved and that they came on the journey with us. So that's kind of how Fora started. It started like let's bring people together and let's give them a space to really achieve, to be productive, to bring them happiness, to inspire them, to give them wellness, so they have an opportunity to be the best version that they want to be of themselves. Definitely. And I've been to a couple of your uh, four spaces in London, and they are amazing buildings. You just feel great walking into them. But they're like hotels, you know. And, um, we don't design like an office. Now I'm sitting on the table, which probably wouldn't do in a normal workspace. And this is set up for a meeting room, but I'll show you something because I can get it off the wall. And I can't, so that's not very good. But we have an iPad on the wall and I can press a button to call water. I can press a button to call the concierge. I can press a button to get tech service. I can press a button to change the lights. I can press a button for coffee. So it's all there to help me so I can concentrate on the meeting and what I want to do. But I could pop down to the reading room and read some books, escape from my, you know, from my everyday work. I could go down to the wellness studio. I could be doing yoga on the terrace. And it, and it really helps me to be happier and productive. Definitely. And, and spend some time with my fellow, you know, my fellow team. Yeah. We can do a yoga class together. Yeah. And it's amazing where those magic ideas for your business can come from. It's not always sitting around a board table, you know. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And um, you were saying to me previously when we were talking, um, Fora's obviously been open this whole time during the pandemic. Um, it's been accessible uh, put along with government regulations. If people needed to access the buildings, we needed to make sure that they were able to access their workspace. And yeah. we've been there to support them all the way. Amazing. And so how has um, Fora found it, the, the, the time during lockdown? And how do you think more in general the, the workspace industry has been affected? Well, we've been really, really busy. The first moment that um, we were very aware of COVID and the impact that it would have on us and our wider community, we set up a safety advisory group for some of our top execs 
so that we could really concentrate on what we needed to do for our business. And we created a document for quite a few weeks called the New Standards Doc, which is available on forestspace.com. Go into the New Standards Deck, that was created for all residents who work across our foreign network so that they could see the changes that were happening within their building, so it would give them the confidence when the time was right for them to return to the workspace. And it showed like how we have thermal imaging in the foyers. We now have introduced hand washing stations immediately in the foyer to people. Um, the bike parks, there's hand sanitization. We've just launched a partnership with Brompton Bikes, so all our residents can hire a Brompton bike uh, for a year or they can just hire it for an hour if they just need to pop out for a meeting. So, you know, we were talking about the commute, Ben was talking about that time we use of the commute. So we've started running programs, cycling programs, we're bringing in cycle maintenance in here, so that you can turn that time into an opportunity to be a healthier version of yourself. And of course, given the current climate, you know, we really want to support people and being healthy. Definitely. And what do you think kind of COVID and the pandemic has meant for the future of workspaces? Do you think it will change the way that workspaces have been previously? Completely. I mean, I feel very fortunate that we always spend a lot of attention on our wellness. We've won awards for the wellness. Um, we became first, what we, we were number one wellness operator within the workspace last year, second internationally. So that has been a really, really big element in it. Um, we work with the Cleveland Clinic over in the States because everybody feels that there is so much information coming at them that we actually have one point of call. If a resident has a query, something that they want to question, we can come back to them on it. Um, but I think that is going to be people will want to know why they're coming to work and they're going to want to come to work for the culture. Um, Ben talked about Benjamin Franklin. If you tell me, I may not learn. You, you know, I may not learn or I may not remember. But if you involve me, I will learn. If you come into the workplace, you are involved with your colleagues, you learn. And especially, you know, if you're coming into the workplace and you're starting a new career, it's important to be able to watch the people who are more experienced in your business. So I think the typical workspace, going back to those cubicles, why would you want to go there? Why would you want to make that journey? And flexibility is so important for the workspace as well. And I think we're going to see that absolutely triumph in the UK. That business owners can decide according to their needs at that time, the size of space they want, plus they can have value that their culture is being looked after by, for example, by us. There are programs to engage their team. Um, we now have talks on anxiety, we have talks for HR leaders and managers on how to actually manage and bring your team back into offices. You don't get that in a typical office. But that's the support people need in the future. So it's all about adding value, bringing a sense of belonging. So you know like you feel, you know, you feel a sense of belonging at home, you've worked there, you don't feel like you have a boss watching you, so you can occasionally go and do that, you know, that yoga class. That's probably why a lot of people are feeling better, because you can stretch out on a sofa. That's how people need to feel in the workspace. They need to feel at home. Definitely. And you can have it on the table occasionally. <laughs> Definitely. And um I think I'm right in saying that you obviously have a lot of like startups, small businesses and founders that obviously All work, cross. work All with mix. in um, so I love the dynamics of that. So and there's a lot of learning and you know in the kitchens networking going on. So like Sony ATV have just moved into our new site on Berners and they're upstairs from Tortoise Media, you know, who do the thinkings with James Harding. But then you have East Castle and there are a lot of people who have just owned desks there. And that's that dynamics of the meeting and the energy that they share. Definitely. And as a startup um, or a founder, you can sometimes feel a bit alone if it's just you or a team. So coming yeah. together in these workspaces, like you've been saying the whole time, is giving the people the sense of togetherness and they can feel like their own little community and their own little team. 
Yeah, and that's really important. So our concierge team in the front of house, um, we spend a lot of time in our whole workshop program with them and in our learning strategy that they're able to, you know, we all like service to a different level. Some of us go into shops and we like everything brought out and some of us want to be alone. You know, so people starting out on their own businesses are different. They have different needs and support. So our concierge team are there to make the introductions when they want them to other people as well. Definitely. And how do you think that, um, that workspaces are going to fit into the future of work? I think that all people will always want to come together and work. I think there'll be a lot more where people will choose times that they want to work from home. There'll be a balance and there'll be a mix. But you'll rely on coming into the office when you want the tech working. Definitely. When you really want to brainstorm with your team. Mm -hmm. When you want to be able to just define your space away from your home life. And not everybody has you know, amazing homes. A lot of us are sitting at the edge of the bed with laptops getting bad backs or sitting on our kitchen table. And it's really great that we have had Zoom. And I, I, I used to joke at the end of the day, I'm Zoomed out. But thankfully, to Magnus and his team, I had Zoom. Yeah. But now, occasionally, if I want to work from home, it's great. I might want to go home a bit earlier, see my kids, and then do a Zoom meet later. So we've now got the tech to be able to choose as and when we work. But when I want to get my head down, when I really want to develop my business and I want to be with my team and going forward, I need to be at Fora. 100%. And I think that that's an amazing message you've got across today. Um, does Fora have anything exciting planned for the future? Yes, we've got, oh, we're really developing our wellness programs at the moment. So we have even more talks coming out. And we have a Restore Festival, which is our wellness festival, coming up on September the 14th to the 18th. We even have a yoga rave with DJ Yoda. And we have our positive psychology talks with chance. We're trying to bring a real sense of fun because people have been working from home. And people have been very much doing their wellness classes on their own. So we're even bringing in circus performers along with our personal trainers. I don't know how that will go. But it's going to be a laugh and it's going to give chance a chance for people to really let go, enjoying being together. And if people don't usually go into the gym, it's a really, really good way to entice them into getting healthy and participating. Definitely. Oh, it sounds amazing. I'll be there. <laughs> um, and if people and want... If, and if you can't make it, Anna, everything is streamed because we've just introduced our new hybrid events package. So we've got full production, full AV. So anybody needs to do a big talk or an event, you can come into one of our event spaces. And we just streamed, I think, Pride Festival back in June to about a thousand people. So amazing amazing work and if people want to get in touch um how's the best way to do that with you or with fora well to go straight to our website and all the contact details are in there and that's foraspace.com and my email is katrina at foraspace.com as well i'd love to hear from people and i love showing fora off Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Katrina. Thank for you, Anna. Hey, it's been an absolute pleasure. You have been amazing, and I'm excited yeah. to see everything. You need to talk about Anna. <laughs> I could talk to you all day, Katrina, but <laughs> no. Thank you so much, thank and um, we'll now pass back over to the gentleman, Ben and Magnus. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna and Katrina. Um, Katrina, I love Fora Spaces. I've been putting in the chat how much we love them over at We Coffee. It's, uh, we've been to a load of different co-working spaces and I think the culture that you guys drive is really impressive. Well, we're not, yeah, we're not just co-working. We draw inspiration from it, but we also draw it from service offices and membership houses. It's just places for people to be and work. Yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. And the, the other time where I spend the rest of my life co-working is over in Zoom. <laughs> Uh, obviously we have Magnus here today, he's our CEO advisor from Zoom. Magnus, do you just want to introduce yourself formally to everybody? 
Thank you very much, Ben, and, and thank you, Katrina and Anna, for a, a, an excellent um, you know, kind of presentation of uh, Forest Spaces. You know, sound very innovative and very exciting. Um, personally, I'm a, um, I've had a 30-year career in using technology to improve business. Um, I'm uh, a CIO, I've been a CIO, I've been a CTO, and I'm now in the portfolio stage of my career. Um, I have a number of roles, some of which are in government, um, but as an antidote to that, I uh, help Zoom have the right conversations with CEOs and CIOs about using video in um, their businesses. And I started with Zoom in September, and uh, life has changed dramatically in the in, in the 10 months that I've been involved uh, because we had the little matter of a pandemic which naturally changed everyone's uh, way of doing work. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's accelerated some of the changes we're looking at and probably got people looking in that crystal ball of what they think the future is and whether that's going to be a world of universal basic income or no offices across the city centres and some of them are sort of dark and gloomy. How's, how's your view Magnus? Do you have a positive outlook on what our future of work will be? Yeah, and no, I've got a hugely positive outlook. I, I, you know, the one thing about the human race is it's incredibly innovative and it finds ways to solve problems. We are going to get through this. A vaccine will come. Um, and even if it's not a perfect vaccine, we will find a way to be able to work and protect ourselves um, whilst you know, adopting lives that are very similar, but then substantially different to what we had before because I think you're right the genie's kind of a bit out of the bottle now because we've been forced everyone's been forced to do something different suddenly a, a huge amount of learning has been done by business leaders by people who are have had those long commutes um, you know and don't really want to go back to them and so people have seen the art of the possible and so I don't think the future is the same as, as the past, even when we're through the, this event. Um, and I loved a lot of what Katrina talked about. There's, you know, there's a huge raft of opportunity here. Um, and for different businesses, that opportunity will be used in different ways. I cannot imagine businesses that don't allow flexibility that will survive. People will not want to work there. People will just shun them because they know what is possible. And if someone is just blatantly not allowing them to do something for no reason other than I don't trust you and I need to see the whites of your eyes every day, I cannot imagine those businesses will survive or thrive. Um, so we've been driven to innovate by the pandemic and lots of people are predicting the future. I really don't know where we're gonna land. What I do know is that the social angle that Katrina and Anna were discussing is so vitally important. You know, and also know that city centres are fun and lively and people want to have that type of interaction and getting together is vital. You, you, can, you can spend a lot of time on Zoom, but you don't really get to know people unless you do spend some time together. I think you can sustain a relationship through video and you can sustain working, but I think it's difficult to create a really deep relationship. So I think we're definitely going to have a mixed economy going forward. I think that um, the social interaction, the in in person, you know, in some of these, um, you know, Katrina's uh, 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 workspaces is going to be vital. But I think it's going to be complemented and enhanced by video in a whole plethora of um, you know innovative and exciting ways. Yeah, I think that's something I get really excited by is the innovation that's been coming through with Zoom as well. It's like you said, it's been used. This is obviously talking about future work and friendly business, but business and social are getting more mixed. We were talking before the event even started that Zoom's been used for social interactions as much as business and people are sort of going on in the evening, whether it's Katrina doing sort of family events, we've all been doing this and social games. What other sort of experimentation and innovation have you seen on Zoom? Well, we've seen you know experimentation, innovation, innovation across the board. You know, in education, in business, in leisure, and a lot of this has been driven by necessity, by people having to keep their businesses running because 
you know, we were in lockdown, you know, we've seen via lesson, violin lessons over Zoom. We've seen yoga, you know, delivered over Zoom. And then we've seen people um, actually working out that maybe they're going to have to be in, a, in this sort of environment for longer than they thought. So I've seen innovation where, you know, and maybe you don't say it's, it's not that innovative, but it is very different where people open up a Zoom room for their team um, and the team go to the Zoom room by default. So on their screens, they have the Zoom room open to replicate that kind of group environment. So while you're doing your, your daily work, you know, doing emails or answering telephone calls or doing other things that you're, you, you would do in your shared workspace, you're also in the Zoom room. So people can hear what you're doing, they can filter it out as they used to do, or they can spot the thing that's interesting to them and then ping you and say, I need to talk to you about this, or, or just talk about it over the Zoom room like they would do in an office environment. And we've seen trading teams do that, service teams do that, you know, small scrum teams do that, where they've just got the default place where they all hang out, which is for me quite, you know, kind of inv innovative in adapting to the need for constant social interaction, constant high bandwidth communication, but trying to replicate that over video. You know, only time will tell whether or not that is as good as working you know in team spaces but certainly that's a really interesting innovation that you know has begun to grow across a whole bunch of sectors and then we've seen some amazing um stuff and you know one example very close to home for zoom we um we we decided that we wanted to introduce an end-to-end -end encrypted service at the moment the encryption is um, handled by keys that are handed out by zoom so we've got a fully encrypted secure service but the gold standard is where the client has their own key. So to do that, we bought a company called Keybase in, in the States, and we did the entire merger and acquisition over Zoom. Um, the CEO of the two companies had never met personally, have never met personally. Um, you know, the, the Keybase staff, or 24 of them, have never met a Zoom person personally. And now we've done the M&A, we've integrated the firms, we're just about to release, you know, the end of July, the the end-to-end -end, um, product in beta, and it's all been done over Zoom. It's mind-blowing, mind-blowing that, you know, the whole M&A process involving transfers of huge amounts of money for the purchase of, you know, IP and the, you know, the, the purchase of a company have all been done over Zoom, not a handshake involved. One of the most exciting things I think I've heard this year is someone who fully committed their life towards building remote working businesses. I've been around M&A deals. I have believed wholeheartedly that this is a totally viable option and can be quick and efficient. And I'm so glad that you've said this. I'll be using this as an example everywhere of what you can achieve. Uh, if you if you turn on your camera and share a space with someone online, like it's yeah. not different. Oh, and amazing. we're seeing this this innovation just across the board. So what Zoom is is kind of a video platform. It does meetings really well, and we're we're doing one of those at the moment and webinars. But it also is the video component that can be used by other applications. Um, and so what we've seen is hundreds of businesses starting to integrate the video component into their line of business applications. So you have a business process and then at a point in the business process, video interaction between two parties or multi parties is essential to allow that to go forward. And at that point, they call the SDK, the software developer kit that allows them to fire up a fully configured Zoom meeting that allows them to have that interaction. Sometimes it's co, you know, um, co-run with document signing or other features. And and when they've done that and everyone's happy, they move to the next stage of the business process. And you know, you know that's that's the business taking over again. But they're using Zoom as the video component. And there are 500 applications commercially available today that use Zoom to as the video component in there. So, you know, in Slack, if you do slash slash Zoom, up comes a, you know, a Zoom meeting, for example, in Trello, something, you know, something similar. Um, 
you, that's the kind of innovation that we were talking about. And when I was talking with CIOs when I first joined, I would say a hundred applications have integrated. So in the last 10 months, 400 new um, applications have launched themselves and are available on the Zoom marketplace um, that use Zoom as their platform for video. It's unbelievable the amount of innovation around the use of video collaboration. We were talking a bit about some of the rapid expansion that you guys have had in Zoom and what that's attributed to. Do you think some of it is actually the building of those applications? Because I love these sorts of integrations as a business who runs on Slack and Zoom. For me, this this makes a difference on adopting a service or, or not, actually. Well, I, I'm not sure that that is the thing that drove people to use Zoom in the first place. I think it's once they've started to use Zoom, they found that that's a very useful second order effect and second order thing that, you know, this business process just fires up Zoom and they know and know how to use it. You know, for example, HSBC, I think, just announced today the amount of video mortgages that they're running, you know, and they're doing it all through Zoom. Um, the, I think what originally got people to use Zoom and why Zoom has become the verb um, is it's just easy to use. It works across all platforms. It's not, you know, in one, one operating system, it works really well on everything else. It's pants, you know, it actually just works across, um, across all platforms and it's reliable, you know, because it's built video first, it's built for the internet era. It understands that some bandwidth is, is better than others. So it allows the application to scale up and down to the bandwidth that's available, not, you know, then not constraining other participants because one person's bandwidth was poor. So I think it was that easy to use the work across platform and reliable. And of course, that it's free to start with, you know, free and easy to start. The whole freemium model was brilliant for the pandemic in that it allowed people just to pick it up and solve their needs immediately without committing with, you know, just being able to experiment. Does this work for me? Because if it does, then, you know, I might move forward. If, if not, if I can just keep myself to 30 minute chats, then fine or 40 minute chats. Actually, I've heard a lot of feedback from people saying that actually when I'm a social interaction, 40 minutes is about long enough. I quite like the prompt that tells me that I've used my time. <laughs> and in fact, I had one person who complained to me when they were given three minutes. They go, well, I normally use that as a trigger to end my conversations. <laughs> And of course, then the, the final thing is that, you know, Zoom is just so feature rich. You know, you, I think once you've started using it, you kind of use it at a certain level. And then you find where well, you can share stuff and you can get the whiteboard and you can do, you know, innovative things and you can do a breakout room. And, um, you know, there are all sorts of interesting things that you can do with it. So, you know, people keep discovering more and more things with it. So I think those were the things that you know, caused Zoom to have the kind of uptick that we saw. Yeah, I think there's some really good lessons to be learned by the startup community, which is obviously something that both at Startup Magazines and We Copy we really support. So I think uh, Harvard business studies are going to be pouring out about Zoom and what's happened over this but Brilliant, fantastic, and, and we all use it. So yeah, I completely agree. I think the last thing, Magnus, before we sort of have to wrap up is just about societal changes we talk about the future of work from a business perspective so much but my understanding is your views are that you think it will impact us as a society quite widely as well could you just elaborate a bit on this because i think it's an interesting topic to yeah i mean my i, I worked to, in the heart of government in the government digital service for a while and i remember having a, a interesting chat with the then cabinet secretary about why the hell don't we have cabinet meetings on video because it means that then you can distribute the um, the ministers of state around the country and actually move power out because the power tends to concentrate around the individuals who hold it and people tend to concentrate around them. Um, and that act of moving people out would have actually been very symbolic in terms of moving that power out, distributing it and thereby allowing people to move with it. Um, and, and, you know, I kind of, the guy looked at me like I had five heads, uh, you know, it was, it was unbelievable. And, and then the day when Boris Johnson tweeted the cabinet office meeting that he held on Zoom, um, which he continues to do, um, you know, it was just an epic moment for kind of, you know, 
it's really nice that things move on and attitudes change. And um, so, you know, I think that it's perfectly possible for our society to use the sorts of technologies that are now available to start taking advantage of, of you know, this whole level up agenda. I think it enables that, it makes it possible. I think it creates many more opportunities for people to do what they would hope to do in in making opportunities available in 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 different parts of our country yeah definitely i think it's been a problem in the uk especially for a long time hasn't it that we don't have our second capital or, or anywhere to attract people into. yeah although it was in the papers today that apparently boris johnson's looking at moving the parliament to york so there we go <laughs> that's quite unusual we'll see what happens okay we'll see what happens yeah um i'm gonna just have a look into the chat and see if there's any questions coming in but i don't think so uh, before i drop anna into it um i'll see if anna wants to make anything closing just while i'm wrapping up at the moment we will send an email out after the event it will have a link back in again to the startups magazine newsletter which i really highly recommend to sign up to uh, we wouldn't partner with them as we coffee. We don't partner with anyone who we don't work with and consume their service and enjoy it. So I wouldn't recommend this otherwise. Um, there'll also be a link to our networking event with we coffee. It'll be a link to actually join one of our networking events for free to come and try out and see what it's like. They are held on Zoom. It is one of their innovative services. I think being run through Zoom as a co-working environment. Uh, so Anna, is there anything you want to say before we wrap up? Just a massive thank you, obviously, to Katrina and Magnus. Um, a massive thank you to everyone for joining. I think it's been really insightful learning two flip sides of the future of work, you know, your offices and then your virtual offices, um, Zoom. And just, yeah, how much, I mean, I've been to four previously and how much workspaces have impacted my life previously, but how much Zoom has really impacted um, our lives. I know you've discussed all this um, during lockdown, but it's just, it's heavenly. I couldn't really imagine my life without it now. So um, yeah, just thank you, both of you and Ben. Thank you. It's been great to partner with you. Um, and our next issue is coming out a little bit later than planned. Uh, it's like the 14th of August, but there's a couple of pieces in there talking about the future of work um, and what we can expect. And we've spoken to some people. So yeah, check that one out for further reading. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Magnus. Bye, all. Thank you, Katrina. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.